Welcome to Radio Who, What, Why. I'm Jeff Shackman. Controversy surrounding the FBI is nothing new. Its tentacles have often seemed to be everywhere, its mission and motives not always pure, and its success often overblown, and its many failures often underreported. We see it today in the murky FBI failures and fingerprints with respect to the Boston bombing, its failures on 9-11, ignored warnings on the recent Parkland shooting, and what we're just starting to find out about its connections with respect to the Pulse nightclub and San Bernardino. So many secret FBI connections to so many disasters. Historically, the story is the same. One such example is the FBI's infiltration and spying on the civil rights movement. It's a story with many players, but at the center of the lens is famed civil rights photographer Ernest Withers. The story of Withers' role in the civil rights movement and his connection to the FBI has come to the surface mostly because of the dogged determination in real journalism of my guest, Mark Perskia. Mark Perskia is a journalist for the Commercial Appeal, the daily newspaper in Memphis, Tennessee, where he's worked for the past 29 years. He's won numerous national awards for his writing and investigative reporting. And it is my pleasure to welcome Mark Perskia here to talk about his book, A Spy in Canaan, How the FBI Used a Famous Photographer to Infiltrate the Civil Rights Movement. Mark, thanks so much for joining us on Radio Who, What, Why. Thank you for having me, Jeff. First of all, for those that don't know, talk a little bit about who Ernest Withers was, this famed photographer. Ernest Withers, uh, although he's not a household name, was a very famous photographer. He was a big photographer in in the movement, the Civil Rights Movement, and he was born and raised in Memphis. Um, he, He was a police officer briefly for the city of Memphis. Uh, He wound up getting caught up in a corruption scandal and got kicked off the force uh, around 1951. And as it turns out, that was probably the best thing that ever happened to him because he began to focus on his photography. He he learned photography when he was in the, the army. Uh, in the Army Photography School, he was he fought in the Pacific, and starting in the early 50s, late 40s, early 50s, he opened a studio on Beale Street. He he went to work as a freelance photographer for the Tri-State Defender, which was the satellite operation of the Chicago Defender. Um, he worked for Jet Magazine. When his career parallels the civil rights movement, he came of age as the movement started to blossom. And he started getting all these great assignments, going out, taking these magnificent pictures. He was there, took this fabulous picture of Dr. King riding a first integrated bus in Montgomery, Alabama in 1956. In 1955, he helped cover the trial of Emmett Till's killers and was in court when Emmett's great uncle, Mose Wright, stood up and pointed an accusing finger at the killers from the witness stand. It was a haunting picture, an incredible moment. The judge had forbid any photography during session. Ernest defied him, took this picture for the ages. But this stuff would go on, on, and on, and on. He, cover, he covered the Little Rock Nine, you know, the integration of Central High and Little Rock, the assassination of Medgar Evers, the integration of Ole Miss, um, the Memphis sanitation strikers, all these big skirmishes, civil rights skirmishes. He was right there in the front lines, and he had incredible access to the leaders and the, and the foot soldiers of the movement. Talk about that, how he began to get that access, because it, the access that he had really became quite remarkable. Yes. Well, I mean, it started with his photography business here in Memphis. He, um, you know, just had, running that studio, he got to know everybody. And being a, being a, a, a patrolman, he walked a beat on Beale Street. Everybody in Memphis knew Ernest. And as the movement grew and he got out there with his cameras, everybody in the, in the movement knew him. He was just he was a, a very likable, affable guy with a big personality um, who who's, you know, had this talent for taking good pictures. And when he would, you know, the, the, the white media largely ignored a lot of the, these developments of the uh, the movement. But, you know, Ernest was there and his pictures would run in African-American papers all over the country. And the leaders of the movement, you know, Andrew Young and others have said, you know, we really look to him as somebody who would get our message out. And so I think his his profile grew as the movement's profile grew. And it really is a remarkable kind of a mirrored story there. And to what extent did his photographs begin to make it into the mainstream press at the time? Well, you know, the picture of Dr. King, um, I'm, I don't recall if that ran at, at that time um, in the white press. There, it, it By the 60s, certainly, 
some of the big papers that the New York Times were picking this stuff up, but really largely, I mean, it wasn't until years later that he was lionized, you know, that people realized what a treasure this guy was. And, uh, you know, when he died in 2007, he had a, a, an obituary in the New York Times and was eulogized by the, by the mayor here in Memphis and saying, you know, not everybody gets a, an obituary in the New York Times. And it's true. I mean, it really speaks to, you know, the level of, you know, his work, the things that he did for the movement and, you know, and, and what a, what a kind of a, a hidden treasure he really was. Of course, the other thing that he did, which, which you have researched for so long and write about here in A Spy in Canaan, is that he became an informant for the FBI. Talk a little bit about how he was recruited by this FBI agent, William Lawrence, and how this all happened. The earliest records that we have, we, we got this big release of records for, through a lawsuit against the FBI. He was first doing something for the FBI in 1958. It's kind of murky. We don't know what it is. But clearly by 1961, he was recruited by Lawrence to be his personal confidential informant. And they were kept crossing paths out there on the civil rights trail. Uh, Will, William Lawrence, Bill Lawrence, was the FBI's domestic intelligence guy here in Memphis for the better part of a quarter century from the late 40s until 1970. And he and his colleagues eviscerated the Communist Party here in the 1950s. And and by the 60s, as all this unrest started blossoming, uh, he his focus shifted a bit to you know, the movement and um, you know, a larger, broader view of uh, agitators, um, subversives, people that they view very dimly. These a lot of these northern activists who came down here, um, they were coming in 1961 to an operation called Tent City in Fayette County, which is in the Memphis area, where sharecroppers who had tried to vote were being kicked off their farms, and they they started living in this kind of, you know, oaky kind of tent settlement. And as these agitators were coming in, you know, people the FBI viewed as agitators uh, from the north to assist them, uh, there was a great need by the FBI, they felt, to monitor this, to make sure there weren't communist influences, to you know, really police it. And that's where Ernest really started making his mark with the FBI. That, and at the same time, in 1961, the Nation of Islam started, started raising its profile down here. They opened a mosque on Beale Street and... You know, Ernest, again, through his access, he knew everybody. He could tell them who they were. You know, this guy, this is where he lives. This is his occupation. These are his relatives. And as they built these dossiers, these were all the kinds of deep personal details that they wanted to know. They wanted to know who was who, who was connected to who, who they were. You know, identification photos that he shot helped build these dossiers as the, as the, as the FBI tried to track this growing movement, you know, whole spectrum and you know in Memphis here, you know, the labor movement, the peace movement, the civil rights movement, and they were really, really trying to to contain these activists. And to what extent was Lawrence, Bill Lawrence, working independently? To what extent was he taking orders directly from the Bureau in Washington? Talk a little bit about that relationship. Well, of course, you know, the Bureau, they they, they ran all these reports, you know, a, a good number of the reports that Lawrence would file these let, you know, they're called letterhead memos. They would go back to Washington. Um, you know, there was some independence. Um, you know, for for some years here, um, you know, Ernest, because when in 1961, when Lawrence was trying to recruit him, uh, he had to get approval from Washington, and he there was a problem because of, you know what they called his reliability test because he had this previous experience with the Memphis Police Department. He got fired in a, in a bootlegging scandal. He wasn't considered the kind of guy that they really wanted to trust, although Ernest, you know, Bill Lawrence trusted him. And so what he did is he kept uh, initially kept Lawrence, uh, kept Withers in the status for two years as a what they called a potential confidential informant. He would direct him around um, kind of in a probationary status. Usually that kind of status will only last a matter of months, but he kept him there for two years in that status and then temporarily downgraded him for a few years to a sort of a lesser informant, a confidential source, which was kind of a reference desk in the black community, really, uh, but still would be directing him you know, to go out and get pictures of certain individuals, information, and they would meet um, 
minimal, minimally about once every month, you know, in lean times and when things were really hot, like during the Memphis sanitation strike in 1968, it was uh, virtually a daily thing where they would be meeting. So uh, Lawrence had some some independence, and I think he, he took advantage of that because he knew he had a good informant, and he many times you'll see these lines in these reports where um, that Ernest Withers is most conversant in all matters in the black community and um, is just a you know what they consider a top-notch racial informant who could deliver the information that they wanted. And was his information about the movement at large, and how frequently was he reporting, or was he really looking at people like King and others, specifically individuals? He, he was looking at the whole spectrum. Sometimes they, would, you know, they wanted him to focus on, on, in on specific individuals. Like, for example, um, 1968, in the, in the weeks before Dr. King was shot here, his organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the whole, he, he'd bring his whole entourage here as he began lending his support to the sanitation strike. One guy they were really particularly uh, zeroed in on was James Bevel. James Bevel was King's director of direct action. He was uh, uh, considered, uh, you know, some people referred to him as a crazy genius. He had some personal issues, but was considered quite brilliant. He was the father of the, the children's crusade in Birmingham, where the, the, the decision was made to bring all these young kids out to march against Bull Connor. And, um, you know, that is considered a pivotal moment in that, in that movement down there. He also influenced Dr. King to come out against the war. Bevel was looked at as a communist and, and, and flirting with treason, really. Um, so, you know, Withers, when, when Bevel was here, um, was kind of following him around. And he, he passed on reports about um, one time he followed him to Lemoyne Owen, which is a um, uh, historically black college here. And, you know, the all-white FBI had no chance of picking up information short of getting this through Withers. And uh, Bevel gives a um, impromptu lecture there, and according to the report coming back from Withers, is given this very virulent Black Power speech, um, kind of thing that is riling up. You know, by the FBI's view, is getting everybody riled up, and they, they looked at uh, Bevel as a as a dangerous guy. Um, you know, Ernest also passed on personal tidbits about um, Bevel's, you know, personal life. Said he had weird sexual habits and 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 other little tidbits had had left his wife and and whatnot but they, he he could focus in on a specific uh individual when they wanted he also helped them just cover this broad spectrum of unrest you know the um you know the sanitation strike here was a was a labor movement really and so it intersected with labor and civil rights and and um you know all of these organizations from the SCLC to the American Federation of State, County, Municipal Employees, to the NAACP, Black Power. Uh, they had various Black Power groups here. Um, the the New Left, um, Campus Radicalism. He really touched on all of it because all he had to do he he was a newsman and he went out. He had that cover, uh, perfect cover of being a newsman. Had a legitimate purpose for being in meetings and and you know was welcomed into a lot of meetings that other newsmen couldn't get into. So. Uh, he was valuable to them on, on, on many levels. In fact, the FBI had other informants inside the SCLC, inside the organization. Right, definitely. Well, you know, the most famous one would be James Harrison, um, who was, you know, based out of Atlanta and uh, was an accountant. Um, he was exposed in the congressional hearings in the 70s after the movement had had died down. And, um, you know, his his role was basically keeping them apprised of their their financial affairs but he would also pass on details about you know king's itinerary his travel and this is kind of probably one of the considered one of the most notorious episodes of the fbi using an informant in, in in ways that could be very damaging you know that he would they'd get the fbi would get his hotel uh itinerary and beat him to the hotel and you know bug the rooms you know trying to trying to catch him in some you know some uh philandering episode so uh yeah that was but that's probably the most famous uh i think informant that we know of that was inside the sclc what was the motivation as far as we understand it for withers to do what he did well really i think money was the big thing um he had a big family he had eight kids to feed he was constantly hustling, hustling a living. I mean, he would 
and he was all over the map. You know, he had his studio photography when when uh, Negro, Negro League baseball was still going on. He would go down there and take pictures of the of the star players and sell them to fans. He was down on Beale Street and knew all the, all the big blues men back in the time before they were even famous. You know, like BB King, Howling Wolf, and others, and would sell pictures to fans. And so he was always hustling up a living. So money was always a concern to him, and he wasn't getting paid a whole lot of money through the FBI, but most informants got nothing at all. So, um, you know, he would, what the FBI told us in, when we settled the suit and had to stipulate how much he was paid, it was $20,000 over these 18 years, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but when you factor in inflation, um, you know, it could get, that's as much as 150,000 today. So you divide that over 18 years, let's say he's getting six to $8,000 a year, I mean, that's going to help put food on the table and it's going to help, you know, buy gas and pay a mortgage and it's nothing to sneeze at. So I think money was a big factor, but, you know, po- politics played a role too. You know, Ernest was more conservative and older than a lot of these movement activists. I mean, he was born in 1922. He was a good 10 to 20 years older than a lot of these activists, and particularly when it came to the war. Now, Ernest would go out and cover these marches. They would send him out a lot of times with a specific purpose. When you read these reports of under the pretext of be, posing as a newsman, is how they would put it in these reports, but was sent out and told, get identification pictures, establish identities, and that's what he was doing. I don't think he, that would be any big problem for him, him being a World War II veteran. Uh, he, had, he was heavily invested in the military. He had, at that point in the you know, mid to late 60s, he had three sons in the military and one in the front lines in, in Vietnam. So, you know, money... His his more conservative view played a role, but also too he always wanted to be a policeman. Um, you know he was a, a policeman for those first three years, 1948 to 1951. So I think he just liked that. Basically, what he was doing was policing the movement and trying to root out the guys that you know the FBI considered to be bad guys. How much of it came out of his bitterness? over the way he was thrown off the police force? No, that's a good question. I, you know, I, I really don't know. I mean, I've read a number of interviews of, that he gave over the years, and he, he would give a variety of reasons for him being thrown off the force, you know, but racism being a factor, uh, rivalries. Uh, they didn't like the fact that he had a photo business on the side. Um, you know, of course, the racism was very prevalent here. You can't discount that out of hand. Uh, but, you know, the, I've been through his whole personnel file. They did a very, very in-depth investigation of this bootlegging incident. It was really petty crime, but, I mean, he was in in concert, uh, acting in concert with a bootlegger, and they were selling, you know, whiskey and splitting the profits. You know, he'd do this, like, you know, buy the whiskey, on, you know, when he was walking a beat and, and you know, give it to the bootlegger. But, you know, so I, bitterness, no doubt, I think did factor into it, but it's hard It's hard to know exactly because there's no specific verbiage in any of these reports that, that talk to that. What did he know about how widespread the FBI's infiltration and investigation of the civil rights movement was? Did he see what he was doing as somewhat isolated, or did he have a sense of how wide a net the FBI had thrown over the movement? <laughs> that is a good question, too. Um, uh, no doubt he'd seen the FBI in, in, in operation in, in, in the big picture. He had, the, the reports make it clear he knew the kind of person that they were after. They are, they're off, there's often verbiage in these reports that he needs to be alert for so-and-so, you know, these agitators out there in the, uh, who were coming into to Fayette County and, and the people who were coming into Memphis. So um, wh- how much did he know that how wide this net was? That's a good question. Um, One interesting passage in these records is going back to 1958, the very first incident that we know of, that I know of, of him informing for the FBI was in Little Rock in 1958 when he was continuing to report on the school crisis over there. And he showed up, shows up at the the field office over there in Little Rock with Simeon Booker. Simeon Booker, of course, was a giant journalist. You know, he he wrote for Jet Magazine. He worked with Ernest on different stories. Booker kind of had his own controversy as an informer, although there's no record he ever got paid and was ever actually naming names or informing on anyone specifically. But he had a very cozy relationship with the FBI. Um, 
he, you know, Booker in interviews he gave said, you know, that when I went down south, I called the FBI because I wanted that protection. He was more, he was very much afraid of, you know, the, the local yokels, the police department, these racists who, who might do him harm. And he felt some sense of protection with the FBI. And he'd write little puff pieces about them sometimes, about the good job that they were doing. But I think there was some influence there. Um, you know, early on in the in the early days of the movement, this is the late fifties. There was still this innocence, and in that that and and that's the way. I think Ernest was kind of primed for this. And so what happens is he winds up getting in really deep. And by the mid to late sixties, the FBI continues to try to recruit, you know, black journalists. And there's kind of this open defiance that they're not going to have, because by then I think everyone had wised up to what the FBI was doing, but you know, Ernest is in so deep at that point. Um, and it's like, there's no turning back. Given his own views, how did he feel? And, and was it part of his motivation the degree to which the anti-war movement and some of the black radical groups were becoming so much a part of and conflated with the civil rights movement. Yes, I think that definitely factored in. Again, he was a World War II veteran, I think a patriot. I think his views very much paralleled that of middle America. You know, the war, you know, it's kind of interesting. We have the benefit now of hindsight, and we can see things, you know, that, you know, the Vietnam War is branded as an unjust war. But at that time, you know, the majority of Americans, including African Americans, supported that war. They certainly were not in favor of King's opposition to the war. So, yeah, I mean, I think all of that played into it. The, you know, the, the radicalism, I, he didn't, he didn't go for a lot of this marching in the street stuff. Um, you know, Memphis had been the movement throughout the fifties and sixties was largely controlled here by the NAACP and the, they were quite a conservative organization when you compare them to other civil rights groups. They believed, you know, of course, that you're going to win your rights through litigation in court. And a lot of this direct action stuff took a long time to take root in Memphis because there simply wasn't the, the stomach for it. What did he think of Dr. King? I think he, he viewed him as a hero. I think King had established himself certainly by the late 60s as, you know, kind of the, the face of the movement. Um, I know that he had problems with King's tactics. Um, there was uh, a very close King associate who moved here to Memphis. You, you, you're going to know him when I mention him, Reverend James Lawson. Mm -hmm. James Lawson was, you know, of course, a movement icon. I mean, he was kind of the father of the sit-in movements, uh, uh, in in Nashville, the the Freedom Rider movement was kind of run out of Nashville for being considered too radical. But in 1962, he moved to Memphis, and almost instantly, the FBI's antenna is up, and and Ernest is kicking back, you know, detailed personal details about him, and and um, you know, um, saying that he's a potential thorn in the side of the movement here. Um, you know, because of this direct action stuff, you know, the getting in the streets and the sit-ins and that sort of thing. And, um, and you know, in passed on details dozens of times, you know, like he at one point tells the FBI that Lawson is planning to coach young men in ways to dodge the draft, that he's planning a, a trip to communist-controlled Czechoslovakia, you know, that he's um, – that he's uh, even passed on details once about a sermon that he gave that, you know, said that he was questioning the virgin birth of Christ. Um, I think King's tactics, although they're viewed now retrospectively, we looked at him as nonviolent, nonviolent versus the more militant, aggressive, you know, movement, but, you know, revolutionaries or whatnot. But in its days, particularly in going back to 63, nonviolence didn't really mean the same thing. Nonviolence was a militant in the early days, in those early years of the 60s. It was someone who was going to get out in the streets and march like they were doing in Birmingham in 63. Mm -hmm. And that was not something that was going to go over real well here in Memphis. James Lawson had a, had a rough go of it for several years while he was here. He was kind of pushed to the side by the more conservative movement leaders here. And, you know, it wasn't until really 1968 when the, the whole volatility of the sanitation strike broke out that Lawson really became this figure that we recognize today as a, 
you know, a, a, you know, a, a, a movement leader. Did Withers have concerns about the FBI going too far in what it was doing? Another good question. Possibly. You know, there are no records that speak to that, so it's hard to say. Um, you know, some people have, have speculated or suggested that, that he kind of played the role of a double agent and that he was um, – that he would withhold information, and it's quite possible he did. Um, he certainly put them off on, you know, certain people that they were zeroing in on. Some individuals, he'd say, you know, this guy's cool. He, he's not. He's not. He's not a threat to anybody. Um, I know there's a one report where, you know, the FBI, again, all white FBI, they, you know, have very little insight into what's going on in the black community, and so many of these young men. Who began, you know, wearing dashikis and wearing their hair and the big Afro hairstyle? Um, the FBI was zeroing in on them, and and you know, Ernest tells him, you know, hey, look, you know, this is just a fad. This is not. These guys aren't revolutionaries. He he helped them think through a lot of things. Um, so, you know, um, whether he went too far, I think is a is a intriguing question that's probably going to take a lot more digging. To really get to that, I don't know whether we'll ever get to it, you know. But it certainly is, is a possibility that that he did. And speaking of digging, in the couple of minutes that we have left, talk a little bit about your journey on this story. How long it's been going on, and really what you <laughs> had to go through from a litigation perspective to get this information out of the FBI. Right. Well, you know, this is it has been a long, interesting journey. Um, of course, I first learned about this way back in 1997. Um, and I've been a reporter here for 29 years of the commercial appeal. Uh, in 1997, uh, James Earl Ray, King's assassin, was still alive. And I was covering his hearings. Uh, he was trying to get out of prison. He was dying of liver disease and wanted to go home. And, uh, you know, it was floating all numbers of pleadings before the criminal court alleging various conspiracies. And it was a big media story. I mean, it was you know national and and uh, international because King's family endorsed these these stories. And King's younger son Dexter actually went and visited Ray in prison, and shook his hand, and said, "You know, we'll do everything in our power to get you out of here." So you know, I'm writing all. They, I got really wide latitude at that point because of the you know the the breadth of the story to you know go and look into a lot of these various conspiracy claims. And that led me to a lot of different people. I was interviewing former police uh, officers, FBI agents, military intelligence. And that's when I met this FBI agent who told me confidentially that Withers was an informant. And I learned a little bit at that time about him, but I never pursued that as a story because the agent said he'd deny it and there was really no footing to go forward. It was only after Ernest died in 2007 and I filed a Freedom of Information Act request in 2008 that uh, in, it took like a year or two after that when I finally got information that uh, revealed his code number, his FBI, and they call it a source symbol number, ME338R. And I was able to track that through other documents and figure out some things that he was doing for the FBI and then eventually met the uh, – the daughter of Bill Lawrence, the agent who ran Withers, and Lawrence, of course, was dead by then, but she had found and saved a lot of his handwritten notes that talked about Ernest, and this led to more stories, and, you know, we felt very firmly that we'd established in, through a newspaper investigation that he was an informant, and we wanted his informant file, but the FBI denied that, said, you know, he never was an informant, so we sued them in a Freedom of Information Act suit. And eventually they had to admit in court he was an informant, and we had this mediated settlement, and they released all these records. Oh, the whole time, you know, contending before that that he never was an informant, and the law actually allowed them to do that because there's a law that says that, um, you know, informant records are exempt from the Freedom of Information Act, and the agency can pretend like they don't even exist, and that's what they did. I mean, they lied. They said, you know, hey, sorry, we don't have anything. So, I mean, it, it was very much an uphill battle, long drawn out. Um, we spent, just in litigating the suit, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. They wound up paying almost all of it back to us in the settlement. So, um, in the end, we've got all these records that are there for anybody to see. They're in the public domain, and I think it really... It helps flesh out this this uh, insidious history here that, uh, you know, there's, just, there's a whole lot more to learn about it. But, you know, I think this was a big step. Mark, I thank you so much for spending time with us here on Radio Who, What, Why. Thank you so much, Jeff. I appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for listening and for joining us here on Radio Who, What, Why. 
I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.